Welcome to All the F Words, a podcast where two writer friends nearly 30 years apart explore everything we give an F about. I'm Gabby Moskowitz. And I'm Joanne Green. On each episode of All the F Words, we'll focus on a theme starting with the letter F. Things like fishing, fans, and forks in the road. We'll share stories from our lives and our distinct generational perspectives, and we'll look to the experts for insights and ideas. Today, we're going to talk about fibbing, when you tell a fable a fabrication, a fairy tale, a falsehood, a tiny little lie. I'm guessing we're going to go deep into when a fib is a lie, like when someone who trades in white lies is actually a liar. You got it, Gabby. It's a very slippery slope. And these days, truth feels to be at a premium. Okay, Joanne, what is the difference between a fib and a lie? In a word, Gabby, it is degree. A fib is a lie, but small enough that it won't have grave consequences. Nobody gets hurt. In fact, a fib is often told to avoid hurting one's feelings. For instance? You tell me that you loved reading a certain book, and you ask me what I thought about it. To avoid getting into it with you, or just to make it seem like we have the same tastes, I say, I did too. When, in actuality, I thought the book was insipid and I couldn't get through half of it. (laughs) So it's like lying about something unimportant, but importance, I kind of think, is in the eye of the beholder, don't you think? Yes, which is why these definitions are totally fluid. So what about a white lie? Same thing? A white lie is said to be a cousin of the fib, or the same thing, depending on your source. Basically, it's a lie that's told to stay out of trouble or perceived trouble. Okay, and you're suggesting that people are more comfortable lying these days than ever before? It's not a simple answer. And actually, when I got into it and did some of the research, I was really surprised by what I found. So let's dive into it. Most people, about 75% of those surveyed in 2021, told zero to two lies per day. So when you do the math, lying compromised 7% of total communication And almost 90% of all lies were little white lies. That doesn't sound too bad. No, but a small percentage of respondents admit to lying all the time. So this study, which um, was done by researchers at three different universities, was called Unpacking Variation in Lie Prevalence, Prolific Liars, Bad Lie Days, or Both. The main conclusion was that even in an era of fake news where what you're hearing on one network can't possibly be true when another network is contradicting it entirely, people are still basically honest. Oh, that's a relief. And we believe one another most of the time. Okay, so who are these prolific liars? Prolific liars, and that is exactly what they're called, are those who report that they tell five or more lies per day. So they tend to be younger, male, and have higher occupational statuses. They're likely to lie the most to their partners and children. They often believe that lying is acceptable in some circumstances, and they're more likely to lie for their own self-interest such as to protect a secret, than to protect others. So you remember those white lies were to keep from hurting somebody's feelings. Prolific liars lie to put themselves at an advantage. They tell five and a half lies for every one white lie told by an average person. And 19.1 lies for every big one that an average person tells. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I I don't even know what to say. And just to go back a little bit, these lies range in, I'm not really sure even how to say it, like intensity, content. Like these are people lying from everything. Like I, one thing I was really thinking about while you were telling me about that is there is so much lying that's worked into the fabric of what just like social discourse looks like. You know, if somebody asks me how I'm doing, most of the time they aren't really asking how I'm doing. Most of the time, the expectation is that I'm going to make 
them feel good or it's like, we're just going to have an exchange. We're just do We're exchanging pleasantries and we got to keep them pleasant, even if that's not necessarily true, because we don't have the time or the energy or the emotional bandwidth to really hear what's going on with someone. So I can see the slippery slope that creates. Right. And I'm not sure that would even qualify as a lie. Um, you know, there are lies by omission, you know, things like that, where you don't go into detail. I think the kind of lies we're talking about here are more like uh, somebody works later, gets caught up, you know, in a phone call at work and says, and realizes that they're going to be 20 minutes later in coming home than usual. And they call their spouse from the car and say, the traffic is really bad. Instead of saying, I got my timing off and I just got caught up in something at work. It's mm. that's that's the kind of white lie where we actually tell an untruth for whatever reason, because it's easier, because it makes us look a little better, it makes it seem like it was out of because we don't want to take responsibility for our actions. I think that might be it part of the time. Um yeah. You know what's amazing, Gabby, is how many studies on the subject of lying are funded. I mean, you would mm. think that the world really rests on this. For instance, one study found out that people are far more willing to lie in an email than they are if they're writing with pen and paper. Mm. And people are more willing to lie. Right. So huh. pen and paper, you're more apt to tell the truth. There's something about that. Um than typing, which I guess maybe it's because mm. it happens more quickly or there's I, a I certain distance. There's also, there's an intimacy about writing pen to paper. I think that's why some people think handwritten thank you notes are more meaningful than emailed thank you notes. I don't know. This is a, a whole other subject, but um, there's I, also, we've got to come there's up with the, the anonymity. Word. The anonymity of... Even e if email is connected to your name, it's a little bit like when I'm, it's just, you know, it's like um, road rage, how ro road rage has often been compared to aggression on the internet because um, you're protected somehow, like, you know, you're, pro you're By the protected windows of your you're car. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're on the other side of the screen when you're typing it. And also you can send it out into the world much faster with a... Um, with a, a handwritten anything, you're, you're taking your time with every letter and then it's, it, you, then you got to make the next step of folding it up and finding an envelope and then dropping it in the mail. Like you've got to be really committed to that lie and, and, and really okay with the lie that you're telling in order to do that by hand. I guess. So that. prolific, prolific liars have no problem doing that. They have no problem lying in any way handwritten, email, on the phone. Um, another thing that this study found out was that more people are willing to lie to protect the team rather than just themselves. Like they somehow, if they're protecting the team, like exaggerating about the team's performance. And when I say team, I mean like a work team. It could also mm. be a sports team, I suppose. But I was thinking more in terms of work team. If they're doing it, they they feel um, somehow elevated or ennobled if they're doing it to protect the team rather than just to protect themselves, which could come across as selfish. But it's if it's to protect a group of which they are a part, then they feel somehow honorable. It, it, hmm. It's crazy. Um, here's another one. Speaking of crazy, people come to believe their own lies. So. We tell ourselves stories all the time, and this is something I've learned over the years that part of the the pitfalls that we all fall into, like, for instance, um, you've talked, Gabby, about um, feeling like, did you cause something, or is it something that you did that's making this situation what it is? That's a story you've told yourself, and then you, uh, tell me if you disagree, but- yeah. You right, so you tell yourself that story, and the more you tell yourself that story, the more you believe it. So lying is the same way. When you lie, 
you actually are telling yourself that story again and again, it alters your memory. So yeah, and I can you I can actually see that believe being, the lie. Well, I and I can see there even being a way to use that for good. You know, like if you if you feel um, like one thing I really struggle with a lot is. I don't let myself off the hook for little for little or even bigger mistakes that I have atoned for and taken care of. And, you know, I, I really relive it over and over again. And I love the idea of, ch- of changing my own narrative. I can see there being it's I like I mean, I absolutely believe that you can that, that um, you know, the brain is plastic. The brain is ha- or has plasticity. It's not actually plastic. But uh, I definitely believe that that one can believe one's own lies and that there are negative and positive um, ways of that going. So I, I would have two little techniques just, you know, that I've that I remind myself of when I start to do that kind of behavior. And I don't do it in the same way you do it, but, you know, we all do it in our own ways. One mm-hmm. is, is that a fact or is that my pers- my viewpoint or my mm-hmm. belief is that a thought or a fact so you know not letting yourself off the hook it's like what would you say to your best friend or to your child or to your husband right you would say you're done you 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 made good right you apologized you accepted responsibility you're off the hook so say what you would say to somebody you love to yourself Mm, and then yeah. evaluate this message that you're giving yourself as to, you know, is that real? Is that an objective fact? Because I think 90% of the time, or maybe even 99.9% of the time, it's not a fact. It's just some, it's a perception that you're reinforcing again and again well, and again. And I think, I think that I sometimes feel and you know it's totally silly but i sometimes feel like i like i i very much feel a lack of control um in general like i i think i'm somebody who who feels like uh i need to control everything and everyone around me and when i can't do that um i or or when i feel like i don't have control in a situation said otherwise uh i will sometimes absorb feelings of blame because it's easier to blame myself than it is to just exist in the aftermath of something unfortunate. Because if I blame myself, then at least I can sort of stitch together some sort of narrative. And it, uh, my husband always says, you know, your mind is playing tricks on you. And quite literally, it sounds like from what you're saying, it, it is. Right. But you do have control of that. And that's the thing to constantly remind yourself is that you don't have to do that and that you're not doing yourself any favors when you do that. I know. You're making it worse for yourself, right? So here's the thing, Gabby, what happens when you think somebody's lying to you? I'm sure that happens. Mm, I often feel, well, it depends on the situation. Um, I think where I get the the times that I experience that most often is when someone is telling me an unimportant lie, um, like about like a little bit of an exaggeration or um, you know something that I know isn't true, and I am faced with whether or not to let them save face or whether to say something about it because when when I know I'm being lied to, especially by somebody I care about. I can feel uh, the intimacy that I have with them being compromised. And so I want to say something, but then sometimes it feels like it's not worth it. And sometimes it does. So um, yeah, but when I, when I can tell that I'm being lied to and it's a big deal, uh, I, as a conflict averse person, I, I sometimes don't say anything, but I'm, I'm getting better at, at speaking up. What do you, what do you do when you can tell your Well, first idea? of all, I want to just tell you what the experts say you should do, which is you should oh, ask yeah. a lot of a lot of why questions. Oh. Okay. How, why, you know, ask questions because when someone is lying, it freaks them out. If you ask them questions that then 
force them to continue lying or digging a deeper and deeper hole. So sometimes Mm. that will quite naturally make the truth come out or they'll backpedal a little bit and go, well, not really that more like this. So it's a Mm -hmm. great technique. Um, I don't, what do I do? Um, Mostly I let it go. Mostly I let it go because I guess I'm conflict averse too, to some degree. Mm -hmm. And if it, but I note it, duly noted. Um, And I have friends who, who lie um, about meaningless things, but they don't lie about anything meaningful. So Mm -hmm. it hasn't compromised my ability to trust them as a friend, um, but it's more like they pretend they didn't know something that they knew or I don't know. Or the other way around. People pretend they know stuff that they don't know all the time. Oh, that's a big one. Like what? What's an example? What's an example of that? You know, I mean, the internet makes it so possible now to, uh, to, to look things up. And I, I feel like I have, I feel like I have interactions with people regularly who claim to know something. And, you know, then later when we talk about it, their information is like the, from the first page of Google, you know, I, and I think that we're all, I think also the more compassionate look at that is that we all kind of feel like all the information we need is like a couple clicks away at this point. And so, you know, I could see someone rationalizing, you know, what's the difference really between um, what I have in my brain right now and what I could have in my brain in 30 seconds. And, you know, it's not that's, real. That's but. really interesting. And we're going to get into into that topic, how tech has impacted the spread of, of truth and falsehood in just a minute, but know-it-alls. So I think that's what you're talking about, are those people in your life who profess to be authorities on all things when they have no mm-hmm. idea what they're talking about. What has intensified it, I think, for know-it-alls across the board, and I, I also find myself falling into this trap, is that sometimes know-it-all-ish conversations really sound like it's like kind of a competition or an unconscious competition between two people over who has read the most, like, you know, we're living in, um, in uh, unprecedented times, right. As they say, and, uh, the information is constantly changing and sometimes know it all ish interactions are about like, who is most up to date on the most recent mask and vaccine guidelines, who knows, Um, exactly what's going on with the January 6th committee. Like It's like, you know, sometimes know-it-alls are really just people in a competition over who has looked at Twitter most recently. And so often we're getting not complete information or there's conflicting information from reliable sources. So I think that we're, I'm seeing a, a lot of uh, maybe know-it-alls who didn't previously um, display know-it-all tendencies before. So. so so, here's a different generational perspective. Older people who were know-it-alls and are maybe now in their 70s or 80s, they really are like the emperor wearing no clothes because the information that they are holding as truth is really old information. And I see this all the time, you know, sort of know-it-alls who really embarrass their themselves past a certain point because they are not looking at Twitter and they are not, they don't have the skill to be able to discern what they're reading on the internet is valid or new. Um, if they're even there on the internet at all. And they're so used to, you know, like reading in a newspaper, which is old news already. So uh, I think that's very, depending on the age of the person you're talking about, um, that sort of exaggeration or confidence in their information is really coming from um, a place that includes sort of when they were at their prime, what were the norms? 
Joanne, I don't know if um, when those people were coming of age, there were podcast commercials, but we are going to take a break so that our listeners can hear from our sponsors and we'll be right back. So one of the places where I see that kind of dynamic that you were talking about, uh, older, older boomers um, kind of coming, well, having a very, very different perspectives that are based on old information is- You mean pontificating about things that they know nothing about? (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, I I think I I really do, I really do understand- um, how, how, how this kind of thing could happen. And it's, I, but I see this dynamic over and over again. I've experienced it directly and I've seen it, um, as a millennial parent with boomer parents, um, where child rearing, the styles in child rearing have changed dramatically. And my parents have been pretty accepting of, uh, the ways that my husband and I have chosen to do things. But I know um, a lot of people who haven't been in that same position or and even when it works uh, or even when when all parties are trying to understand the other, I I think I understand now as a parent for the first time how crazy it must feel to have your own child doing something dramatically differently from how you did it when you were raising them. So I know that's we're a little astray from the from the whole idea of fibbing, but it was just making me think about how millennial parent or millennial parents of of kids who are growing up now and their boomer their boomer parents, the grandparents of those children, um, are really coming from very different places and communication about what is the right thing to do. Um, when it feels, I think this is an area where sometimes it feels like someone is lying, but when, when you know, when you experience something to be true and then someone you love very much is experiencing the diametrically opposed thing to also be true, that is challenging. Very interesting. I want to talk about trust for a minute because it's, it's really at the core of how societies function and tech, technology, the internet has, and our ability now to communicate in so many different ways on so many different platforms and the immediacy of that communication and how that has impacted the spread of truth and falsehood. So there's a professor at Stanford, Jeffrey Hancock, who um, has done some really interesting work. He did a major study in 2004 and then recently has done a couple of updates. And so I looked at the original study and then I listened to a lecture and we've got um, links to this in the show notes. And what he's looking at is like, let's go back a step that the whole notion of the psychological aspects, you know, this whole idea of trust and deception that actually, and, I, and I'm going to use the word trumps, even though I'm, it has nothing to do with what you're thinking, but I can't think of it, <laughs> supersedes tech. So like um, it used to be, uh, it used to cost huge amounts of money and be very complicated to persuade people of things. Now it's really easy. Also, like it used to be very expensive and, and involve a lot to foment dissent or polarization. Now it's immediate, it's easy, it's cheap. So that is a difference um, that that tech has had. So an example of that would be um, there's like a supposition that people are lying more because they're interacting more through text. So that is so easy. So are people lying more? And this 2004 study showed most of the lying was actually done on the phone the next most was face-to-face and the least in email. And that is because email creates a record that can be copied and shared. So technology doesn't really determine whether we lie or not. It provides opportunities and constraints, but people get it that putting something in writing is different 
than on the phone. So it's easy to lie on the phone because you're not looking at the person. Mm-hmm. Um, but people lie more face to face, like for instance, on a Zoom or a FaceTime or something like that, or in person. They lie more that way than they do in email. So then in 2021, they looked at this all over again, because obviously in 2004, we didn't have as many ways to communicate electronically. Same pattern with phone, face-to-face, and then email. So social media and texting actually end up looking just like email. Writing it down in some fashion somehow makes people be a little bit more honest or a little less inclined to lie. Um, That is when we communicate with people we know. You digress? (laughs) Uh, well, I, it does make me think about something about the, a way. So one thing that uh, I believe, I absolutely believe that, uh, you know, and we've, we've seen over and over again that pe- people's, uh, social media gets used against them in criminal cases all the time. Or, I mean, how many times have we seen someone get canceled by old tweets that comes up over and over again, but there's another kind of lying that I think is and gen z seems a little less tolerant of it and kind of what is trending with them from my elderly millennial perspective seems to be more um uh real reality showing showing what's true but if you think about like instagram and filters and facetune and all the editing apps and People who uh, use, you know, uh, at least in the food world, like tons of like fake like marble slabs to make it look like they're in an all white, gleaming, expensive kitchen. There's a lot of of um, subtle fibbing that happens at, on um, photo based social media that has been shown to be really destructive to, uh, you know, and the, and all of it, the way that, um, people perceive themselves, you know, the whole, the Kardashians and this, this whole trend of editing yourself beyond existence, I think is a whole other component of the lying that happens on social media. One of the thing, first of all, two things real quick, um, the, this professor mentions at some point that lawyers tend to call email evidence mail. So, right. Once Mm -hmm. it's, once it's written, it can be, it can be called into play. Also, um, he talks about positive bias that we face to face. We also try to present positively. Someone says, how are you? We are not inclined to tell them what our problems are, what hurts today. We're just inclined to sort of put our best foot forward. So, so too with enhanced imaging, you're not, are you lying if you, you know, Photoshop out your pimples or are you, are you being deceptive? I mean, it's a slippery slope, right? Like everything else. But since we know that everybody's doing that, I think we don't necessarily look at someone and say her skin is gorgeous when we, we know there's a very good chance that it's an enhanced photo. It's interesting. One of the things that I found interesting here is that it is said that we generally lie. Now, we're not talking about slightly mislead or paint a nicer picture, but we lie as a last resort. And one of the times we lie most frequently is that when we're asked a question and we have to respond quickly. So video chat ends up being pretty much the same lie rate as phone. Um, mostly people tell the truth, but the, the rate of lying on phone or video chat in 2021 was 12%. Now that sounds high to me, Here's but a, I have a according question. to this, yeah. I have a question about these studies. <laughs> Are they, is it self-reported? Are people self-reporting how much they lie? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a little meta, don't you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, but I think they account for that somehow. I don't know. These are social scientists Mm. and psychologists. What do I know? 
There's this thing called truth bias. People are more likely to say and to believe what they hear. Yep, that's true. At, at mm. heart, we are a very trusting species. Um, we often even think deceptive messages are true. So, I mean, there. What, what does he say? He says, there's no Pinocchio's nose. We think we can tell when people are lying. We can't. And this is something that they've studied again and again. People do not like twitch in a funny way when they're lying. I mean, people lie like just boldly looking straight at you. You can't tell. Um, and then the other thing is most people lie for a reason. They're trying to accomplish something and they think this is their best option or their easiest option. Doesn't mm. mean they're going to accomplish it, but but they lie for a reason. I think prolific liars um, get so in the habit of lying in some cases that they they are just as easily lying as telling the truth. It's just storytelling. It's whatever comes out of their mouth. Um, and the sharing of dis of disinformation, this is what I found most encouraging because I have felt like, you know, fake news got legitimized in this last administration. And clearly I have certain things I accept to be truth, what I hear in certain media where other people who are listening to different sources, newspapers, television networks, whatever, internet sites are accepting something very different as truth. Most sharing of disinformation is actually shared by a small number of people. So mm -hmm. overall, I think um, I'm encouraged, you know, by what I have um, learned here about lying, that we're basically trusting. Most of us do not lie. When we do, they're mostly white lies. And um, we're not lying more because we have more ways to communicate and faster ways to communicate. So overall, good news? Yeah, sounds like it. That's good. We can always use good news these days. Absolutely. One last thing before we wrap up. Have you gotten into it with um, Anna, Ducky, yet about lying? With lying. Because there is a... There is a certain moment where, and I think it's about age three, where mm -hmm. kids start to lie. It comes up. It comes up. Mostly about, I mean, sometimes it's like, what did you do today? And she's like, we jumped up to the tallest trees and we flew and I rode a dolphin. And like, you know, I don't, I'm not too troubled by that. And then sometimes it's like, you know, uh, did you already go potty or do you need to go potty before we go? And she'll say she already went potty. And then I'll check with Evan and he'll say, no, she hasn't gone potty yet. And it's like, I think usually the, the places I see her lying are these little areas where I can, where about things where she wants to have, she has very little autonomy, you know, because she's four and, um, very little, you know, control over things. And so sometimes she will experiment with whether or not she can get us to believe stuff. And so, you know, I've just started gently verifying, you know, I don't want her to think that I think that she's a liar. Um, and so I will, you know, but I, we have had conversations about how important it is to always say what's true. And I talk about how it comes from a safety you know, we, we, uh, we always want you to be safe. And so it's important that we have, you know, that we're able to tell each other the truth. It's tricky though. One thing we didn't talk about in this episode is lying to kids because I, I try to tell my kids, I mean, only one of them really talks a lot. So I try to tell them <laughs> the truth about things and I, and I try not to hide, um, you know, Think, I, I try. I try never to tell them. Oh, don't listen. You don't. You don't need to know about that thing. Don't worry about it. You know. I try to to always have a child appropriate way of explaining things. But in order to protect their innocence, in order to protect um, their brains from scary stuff, and you know, and and sometimes because some things are 
just grown up information. I do have to find ways to talk to them about that. And, you know, it's one thing in the middle of the day when I have all my wits about me and, you know, she asks if, you know, um, the tooth fairy is real. Yeah. Or (laughs) death or like some, you know, big, big topic you know, we've been talking and talking on and on and on for quite some time about what happened to the dinosaurs. And I have told her, but it's a big topic and she is very upset by it. And so it's quite another thing in the middle of the night when she's awake and upset and scared and wants to dig into like extinction and whether she could go extinct. You know, that's not the time when I'm going to pull out all of my um, truth telling skills as a parent. So fairies, but yeah, it's complicated. I wouldn't call that lying though. I wouldn't call that lying. I would call that appropriate parenting and, um, and you do such a good job and she's challenging because she's a deep thinker and Mm. you don't often meet a deep thinking four-year-old. So she will challenge you and continue to. Gone are the days, gone are the days of talking in front of her about anything we don't want her to know about. And now that she's starting to read, sometimes even spelling stuff is uh, like, we just, all our conversations just have to be about whatever she's thinking about, which is usually dinosaurs. Try pig Latin. Oh, that's a good idea. Thanks so much for listening to our episode today on fibbing. We couldn't decide whether to call it falsehoods or fibbing, but it's all the same. And and didn't I have a lot of uh, fairy tales fabrication? There were a lot of F words for this. We had a lot of good ones in there. Please follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And we are on social media. Come hang out with us. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at All The F Words Pod. And we would love for you to email us lies or otherwise we are all the efforts pod at gmail.com test us see if we can spot your lies (laughs) and have a good week bye-bye bye